Good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski. I will be your host for today. And today I'm coming to you live from Austin, Texas. I'm down for the South by Southwest Education Festival, and I'll be presenting there later this afternoon. But before we get that going, we are going to spend a little time hanging out with Lily Woodbury. And Lily is currently in her dream job as the chapter manager for Surfrider Pacific Rim which has the current aim of eliminating single-use plastics, implementing uh, progressive recycling practices, uh, and working with public, youth, and businesses through programs and events to raise awareness about coastal stewardship and ocean-friendly behaviors. So Lily's lived most of her life uh, in the Great Lakes uh, region in rural Northern Ontario, and she's recently returned to Tofino, British Columbia. Since graduating, she's worked on a diverse number of campaigns, from salmon protection to mining, She's also worked with Greenpeace in New Zealand. Lily, it's so great to have you joining us from Tofino today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And hey to all the classes that have joined. I'm really excited to share a little bit about myself and Surf Rider's story with you. And I cannot wait to hear any of your questions and all the things that you're all doing to protect the ocean, beaches, and waves. So I'll screen share now and put on rotation. So I'll be back here on the webcam to discuss afterwards. Okay. So Lily, just let me know when it pops up on your end so I know um, it opened okay. There we go. Okay, here we are. So as Joe was saying, I won the birthplace lottery when I came into this world at the edge of the sea in Tofino, British Columbia, pictured here. This is beautiful Tofino where I am right now. So I spent the first four years of my life on the beach, playing where the tide meets the sand, which sometimes included getting dragged in by the waves and getting to know the spectrum of emotions that the ocean flows through. At the age of four, I moved north of Toronto to Manitoulin Island, located on Lake Huron. And for the next 13 years, I lived by and loved the Great Lakes. But since I was little, I had a determined plan to move back to Tofino and find peace by one of my first and greatest friends, the Pacific Ocean. At the age of 18, which is the age I am, I fulfilled my lifelong dream and moved back to Tofino only for the summer before moving to Toronto to start my undergraduate degree in environmental studies and cinema studies at the University of Toronto. As soon as I moved to Toronto, I started school and jumped into the deep end of environmental studies. When my life went from being a really excited young person to being completely overwhelmed by all the really bad news. From only knowing a slice of the issues to suddenly trying to digest the whole picture. Pollution, climate change, species extinction, environmental racism, desertification, rising sea levels. I don't think I've ever been depressed, except for that the first semester. Everywhere I looked in Toronto, all I could see was adversity, environmentally and socially. At one point, I questioned continuing my program. I had fallen into one of the most dangerous places, which is one of no hope. That same first year, I had an epiphany that changed my life forever. I started reading some great books written by environmentalists who explained, what is the point of doing good if we do not enjoy ourselves? One author concluded, we would live the most fulfilling lives if we did our best and loved our lives in the process. And then even if we didn't make an ounce of difference, then at least we had a good time while we were on Earth. However, by being optimistic, positive, and involved in making a difference, our efforts are amplified as people around us see this and they want to get involved. Fast forward, I'm now the chapter manager for Surfrider Pacific Rim, a chapter of Surfrider Foundation which began in 1984 in San Clemente, California by surfers who are eager to protect their surf break. The mission of this foundation is the protection and enjoyment of the ocean, beaches, and waves, which is enacted through a powerful activist network which spans internationally. 
We have a large global focus, which can be split into coastal preservation, plastic pollution, beach access, clean water, and ocean protection. What I love about Surfrider is that we have a broad mission, but we can choose to work on the issues that are the most pertinent to our local area. We even have the freedom to develop our own campaigns and share the resources we collect with other chapters. The focus for the Pacific Rim chapter, as Joe was saying, is identifying and eliminating single-use plastics, implementing progressive recycling practices for petroleum-based products, and working with youth, businesses, locals, and visitors through programs and events that raise awareness about coastal stewardship and ocean-friendly behaviors. Like the rest of the network, we tell stories around ocean conservation in a positive and uplifting way which is powerful because people feel inspired and hopeful and realize that they are a necessary part of the change. And this picture is from our remote cleanup series and all these super sacks are filled with marine debris. Surfrider Foundation's largest program is Rise Above Plastics, which raises awareness about the dangers of plastic pollution and by advocating for the elimination and reduction of single use plastics. As we know, there's an overwhelming amount of plastic in our aquatic environments. And this has quickly become one of the largest issues we are facing on our planet, threatening biodiversity, food security, our cultures, our economies, our whole interconnected way of life. At Surfrider Pacific Rim, we have multiple campaigns that run under this program, which includes Straws Suck. This campaign eliminated plastic straws from all businesses in Tofino in the spring of 2016. And this campaign went viral, gaining 9 million views worldwide. This campaign was started by our chapter in Surfrider, and since it has been shared with the rest of the network, including Surfrider San Francisco, and most recently, Surfrider Vancouver Island, which is in Victoria on Vancouver Island. Many other municipalities and organizations have also contacted us for assistance in launching this campaign, including Guelph, Canmore in Alberta, and Wellington and New Zealand. We have just launched this launch straw suck in the other Pacific Rim municipality called Uclulet, so by the spring of 2019, the entire Pacific Rim region will be plastic straw free. And this movement is spreading. We are all remembering how great it is to sip cocktails and non-alcoholic cocktails without a straw. And I'm really excited to hear from all of you to see if the school you're in or the town you're in, if this movement has spread to your town and to see if you have personally taken the pledge to give up single use plastic straws. We also run the ban the, ba ban the Bag campaign. Right now we are working with businesses to assist them in voluntarily giving up plastic bags. And through our Stitch and Beach group, we get the community together to make reusable bags from recycled textiles so that people don't need to use the plastic bags. Now, young to elderly people in our community have engaged in this campaign, and so far it's working. Our biggest store, the Tofino Co-op chain, was super inspired by our efforts to make free bags for them, and in October of last year, they eliminated plastic bags from their checkouts, saving 75,000 bags a year from entering our environment. We didn't go to council and ask for an outright ban. We got the whole community involved to create change, pictured here, thousands of reusable bags made. I'm still awful at sewing, and I don't foresee that changing anytime soon, even though I'm working on it, but I do know how to help a business cut their ties to plastic. A lot of our focus is on waste management. As our improper management of waste contributes to the climate crisis, it contributes to plastic pollution, um, and it contributes to social injustices, among many other issues. So we create systems for recycling items that are commonly sent to landfill or end up polluting our environment so that they can be turned into useful products which eliminates the need to extract raw resources, which causes an unbelievable amount of pollution. Through our Hold On To Your Butt campaign, cigarettes are collected and recycled into plastic lumber by TerraCycle, which is located in Toronto. Cigarette butts are commonly found throughout all the beaches here in the Pacific Rim. And as a biodiversity hotspot, we knew this needed to be addressed. Since beginning this campaign in the spring, we have now recycled 120,000 cigarette butts through TerraCycle which is pretty amazing. Um, we're still figuring out options for storage. Recently, I had 50,000 butts waiting to be picked up outside of my house, which you can imagine did not smell great. So I think this really confused local kids and my neighbors who now think I'm kind of a freak and are concerned about my health. 
Pictured here is a volunteer, and those are all the cigarette butts, and that's probably only about a thousand. So you can imagine we've recycled about 121 times that amount. All the debris collected from our beach cleanups is also recycled through the Marine Debris Intake Center at Ocean Legacy Foundation in Vancouver. They divert 90% of marine debris from landfill and work with partners, including Lush Cosmetics, to turn plastic debris into packaging for ocean-friendly products. So now, even the, the beach cleanups that we do are zero waste, ensuring everything is used and nothing is wasted. I think it's important we learn from an ethic of respecting everything and all the materials we use, which ultimately come from the earth. Ideally, the products I have mentioned above will be made out of plastic alternatives. But as a solution in the meantime, we must create and implement ways to extend their life, which is called from cradle to cradle. Ocean Legacy is also looking to set up more marine debris intake centers across Canada and in other places in the States, as well as in Central America, so that we can make it common that all this plastic going into the ocean, we can keep turning it into a resource. We can keep seeing that it does not end up in landfill. The program that we are best known for at Surfrider is Love Your Beach Clean. We host monthly cleanups on community beaches in the Pacific Rim and engage our local First Nation governments, parks teams, local youth and schools, businesses, as well as surf competitions. So in 2017, we had a pretty amazing accomplishment. We spent 44 days combing the coast with over 36 organized cleanups. Now, this amount wasn't our initial goal, but as we know, reality often has different plans for us. Back in November 2016, Hanjin Shipping lost 35 massive polystyrene insulated metal containers in the Juan de Fuca Strait, which washed up and blew up all over the Pacific Rim, including in Barclay Sound and Clackwood Sound. So here you can see, this is just one wall of a container. So 36 of these blew up, and so imagine there's six walls of all all of these, all filled with this orange foam you can see here on the side, which breaks up really into small, tiny little pieces. So our local Pacific Rim National Park team went after compensation from this corporation called Hanjin to deal with all of these damages, and they successfully received $76,000. However, these funds got tied up with our federal government, and they were not released until May. So you can imagine from November until May, all of these foam getting spread, spread and split up. So obviously it went from a very not ideal situation to becoming drastically worse. When the funding was released, Parks Canada invited Surfrider Pacific Rim to collaborate on cleaning up the debris. And so in June, we began a series of 13 remote cleanups expanding 16 days. And this autumn, we completed the project after countless scratches, bruises, laughs, and wildlife encounters. Personally, I've learned the hard way to check your bags and remove any kind of soap when camping in wolf territory. Yes, a little wolf tried to get into my tent, but it was okay. Now, yeah, so this is what the foam looks like. All these tiny, tiny pieces that are one millimeter to you know, meters in size. Now, a vast majority of what we found in our cleanups was not just from the Hanjin spill. We discovered a shocking amount of plastic including 30,000 plastic bottles. What you see here, this is just a regular scene when you come here on the coast. So you see plastic bottles all collected like this. So 30,000 plastic bottles, eight tons of rope, just like here in the bottom right corner, as well as 800 buoys and 32 cars worth of polystyrene. So imagine a parking lot filled with 32 cars. That's the amount of styrofoam that we picked up. So all of our cleanups, our local as well as our remote, are an opportunity to collect data and use these insights to inform our campaigns and programs that we work that, so that we can work to make cleanups obsolete. We also use the data along with photographs to educate the public, the businesses we work with, and the schools through our youth environmental stewardship program. Now the youth in our communities are working to lead their own cleanups. Their next one is coming on March 14th. I wish you could all join. It would be super fun. Um, and they're also running their own campaigns to eliminate single-use plastics from their school, including running waste-free lunches and waste-free smoothies. The data we gain from cleanups is also a tool to influence legislation. Currently, there is no policy in place to protect the coast from infrastructure and shipping spills that cause marine debris, much like the Hanjin shipping spill. The burden of these accidents falls on municipalities and volunteer groups who don't always have the capacity to deal with these emergencies. 
From this cleanup, we are using our data to influence policymakers and get a plan in place that puts more responsibility onto the provincial and federal government. Right now, this includes giving feedback to our MP, Gord Johns, as he has put forward Motion 151 in the House of Commons, which has a twofold imperative to clean up the existing debris and damage that has been caused by plastic pollution and to put a coordinated plan in place to prevent the persistence of plastic pollution in Canada's waterways. So this is huge. From cleanup groups like Mayan on the Coast, we have really worked to galvanize this movement so much that now it's gaining traction on a federal level. And now in June, Canada is using a, our, our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is using Canada's presidency of the G7 to address ocean pollution and plastic pollution and get the other members of the G7 signed on to make some real commitments. So this is huge. This year is really big for ocean protection. So our hope is to get this motion into place and see some legislation that has a concrete plan from protecting Canada's oceans from plastic pollution. From all of this, I want to conclude that it isn't the sole responsibility of our government or our industry and businesses, but it involves every single one of us. Everything we do has an impact on our shared oceans, from our consumptive behaviors to our attitudes. And from Surfrider, I have learned that the stories we tell about ourselves on our role on the planet is shifting. We are seeing that we are all, that we can all make a difference and have a damn good time in the process. This means skipping single-use plastic straws, from coffee cups to bottles, remembering to bring your own mug when you go out. This means being conscious of everything we consume, as well as the waste we create and how we are dealing with it, from food scraps to all kinds of things like cigarette butts, even though none of you guys are smoking and hopefully never do. Um, this means working with our community members to make a difference, on the beach or on a sewing machine creating bags. Celebrating successes and businesses that are setting an example and working with the youth in our lives, just like all of you, and letting you know that you are the true stewards of this planet. This means talking to our local government representatives and voicing our environmental concerns and supporting policies that protect our oceans and waterways. We can all make a small difference. And as we've seen at Surfrider Pacific Rim, these can ripple outwards and end up being catalysts for major waves of transformation. Thank you. All right, Lily, thank you so much for sharing uh, that with us today. It's such a awesome message to see uh, how individuals working together can make such a big difference and have such a big impact that can spread far and wide. So thank you very much for what you're doing. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. I'm gonna get back on get back to the screen here. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. If you just hit the green button again, it'll, it'll bring you back. If you hit the green Perfect. share button again, yeah, it should bring it back. Great. There we go. <laughs> there we are. All right. Well, I'm glad that worked out this time as well. We, um, yeah. We've tried this hangout before, but uh, the internet didn't cooperate with us, so Obviously, being in Tofino, it's a little bit slower, but we were able to do the presentation, so that was great. Yay, yeah, thank you. I had a lot of fun, and I'm really looking forward to hearing back from everyone else, their thoughts, and what they and their schools are doing to protect the oceans. Excellent. Well, let's start meeting some of those classrooms now. Um, let me switch my screen. So first, let's go to Stony Creek in London, Ontario. Uh, we have a grade four class with Mrs. Player joining us. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing today, grade fours? Good. All right. Let's maybe start doing two things. Uh, first, if someone maybe wants to tell us, is there anything you're doing in your school to combat plastics? And then second, maybe hit us with a question. How does that sound? Good. 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 All right. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. We have been researching on Canada and the environment of stuff, in, and we uh, we know that some of our needs have caused some bad things in our land. That's really great. So. You're looking at the meat industry and the ways that they're, that this industry is polluting our environment. Yeah, and what have you learned? Like, what have you come up with your research? 
so yeah, we've been, I just want to clarify that a little bit. We've been um, researching Canada's provinces and territories and their natural resources. And um, we have found out things that Canada's, you know, has mining in every province or territory. Um, and that our need for natural resources affects the environment quite a bit. And so we have been wondering how we can be good environmental stewards. That is a great question. And I'm so excited that you are learning about these things. So there are so many things that we can do to be environmental stewards at any age, you know, especially the age that you are at because you're all such amazing leaders and adults in our communities, we all look to you. We all look to you because you're inheriting this planet. So being good environmental stewards, it starts with what you're doing right now. It starts with getting educated and doing research and finding out about what's actually happening in Canada. As your teacher was saying, um, Canada has a lot of resource extraction. So we are really big. We have a lot of logging. We have a lot of fish farming. We have a lot of mining, which all do impact our land, our resources, and of course, our human communities. So a lot of what we can do, and as I was saying in my presentation, is by seeing how we how what we do impacts our planet so you know thinking about what we're eating what we're buying you know all of the, oh, who is that <laughs> no no we're, we're good okay it's probably, good it's probably the classroom bell yeah. <laughs> great so yes um looking at the different things that we consume and seeing how we can make a difference. You know, just thinking of the one student and what she said about meat. The food that we eat has a really big, important part of the way that, the way that we impact our environment. If you know, this means, this could look like for all of you, going with your parents to the supermarkets, like the, the food markets, farmers markets in the summer and getting local organic food that are supporting local farmers that aren't using chemicals like pesticides and fertilizers, which end up hurting the land, going into the water, going into the ocean. You know, a lot of times at farmers markets, they're not using, they're not packaging everything in plastic. So again, the footprint is a lot lower, both for fossil fuels and for plastic. So that is just one example. Another one is our clothing. You know, all the clothes that we buy, where are they coming from? Are they coming from um, across in another country where maybe the conditions aren't as really great? Maybe there's little kids and people who are working on these, on these clothes that aren't really getting paid a really great wage. And then again, they're getting transported across the world and are often made of plastics. They're often made of um, synthetic fibers like... Um, polyester. So when we wash these clothing, our clothing that are made from, from synthetic fibers, the fibers then go into our water. And so now our oceans, one of the biggest problems is microfibers from our clothing. So what we can do here is buying clothing like bamboo, buying clothing like organic cotton, all these kinds of things that are made from natural fibers. There's a really great thing you should all look up. It's called the Guppy Friend. So it's a bag that you put any of your clothes into that might be made from synthetic materials because most of us have that because they're much cheaper. And it prevents any kind of um, microfibers from entering into your water, which is a really great invention. So that is another thing that all of you can do. But yeah, what I would say is keep doing your research, keep doing your conversations, launch your own campaigns in your schools for recycling, for waste management, for climate change, for pollution, organic food, all of these kinds of things. Um, when you do one thing, it's just going to lead to another. And once you start one campaign, you're going to see the whole world differently and it's going to lead you on to other environmental endeavors. So you are on the right path and you're going to keep going. And if you have any questions or about launching your own campaign or making any changes, you can email me anytime. All right, excellent. And I'm more than happy to share uh, the address with teachers so they can do that. Um, let's, see. let's see. So Mrs. McKay's class, are you guys able to hear me okay? I know you guys are having a little tech problem. I, I saw you dip in and out a couple times. Mrs. McKay's class, can you guys hear us? All right, well, we'll come back to their group. Um, let's see. So Mrs. Player's class, we will come back to you guys for uh, another question. Let's go to Mrs. Simon's class this time. Grade six sevens. How's it going, six sevens? Good. All right. Is there anything you'd like to either share with Lily or do you guys have a question? Uh, yes, we do have a question. Our school right now, we live in, we're from Corona. 
Ontario. So we're right on uh, the Southern Great Lakes Basin. Um, we feed into um, a couple of the Great Lakes and we're a uh, shipping route in the Great Lakes as well. So we're also known as Chemical Valley. Uh, so a lot of our uh, plastics that you receive uh, the chemicals for come from our region. So we are a school also that is looking for ways to get involved uh, because right now our community does not have recycling for our school. So uh, we have a question from Hunter. Great. Hunter. What steps can, can we around the Southern Great Lakes take to help eliminate single-use plastics from our waterways? That's a really great question. And I know the area that you're living in, I'm a little bit familiar with it. And being this classroom that you're in, you have such a great opportunity to make change. All of this pollution can be addressed and you can 100% get recycling in your school. So one of the things I would say for your question, Hunter, is look at your school cafeteria. Look at the places where there's single use plastics. And as a class, write down what are the top single use plastics? Are they straws? Are you using plastic bottles in your vending machines? Are people getting smoothie cups? Are people getting coffee cups? I don't, you know, probably don't drink coffee, but maybe, yeah, you probably don't drink coffee. You're too young for that. But you get what I mean. So write down some of these items and then figure out, okay, are there alternatives for these items? You know, like plastic straws. The one thing we've done in Tofino is we've started using paper straws. So paper straws, when they go into the lake or they go into the ocean, they're going to disintegrate. They aren't going to last forever like plastic. So that's a really great one that you can use. For plastic water bottles, what you could do is start potentially sourcing reusable water bottles, maybe applying for funding to get a water dispenser so that people can use a water bottle instead of buying the plastic. Um, one thing that we do with our Youth Environmental Stewardship Program is that we do beach cleanups. How many of you like going to the beach? Do you have beaches near you or rivers or lakes? Yeah, nice. Yes. <laughs> So I would say definitely go, like, do your own beach cleanup. A really powerful way to show the issue to your school is by going and running your own beach cleanup and everything you collect, having a data sheet and showing how many straws did you collect, how many bags, you know, how many different items. And then you can see what we call our trash trends. And then you can use this data to implement a campaign in your school and say, hey, we need recycling. Look at all this stuff that's washing up on our environment. You know, so you can definitely do that as well. And if you need any resources, I have a whole guideline that shows you how to run your own beach cleanup. And a beach cleanup, especially with people like you, um, youth like yourselves, is that you can get newspaper involved. You can get so much media on it and really show your community that you are making a change and that you do want to keep the Great Lakes clean and your environment clean. So, yeah, I would start there with the single-use plastics and running your own beach cleanup. All right, some great advice to get them started. Um, Mrs. McKay's class, are you guys able to hear me okay? Yeah. All right, well, let's get your question in because I know you're having a little bit of trouble maybe with the internet today. So uh, Mrs. McKay's class is joining us from Burlington. They're grade fours uh, here in Ontario. And go ahead with a question for Lily. Yeah, go ahead, nice and loud. Um, have you ever like ran on... Um like a beach cleanup campaign or, or are you going to start running one? So the question was, have you ever run a beach campaign, a uh, beach cleanup campaign, or um, are you, would you start running one? Um, like doing a beach cleanup? Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah, so we, we do both. So we do beach cleanups every month, but then we use that information that we get from our beach clean to start our campaigns. So the one I told you about, hold on to your butt, we started that one because in one cleanup, in about two hours, we collected over a thousand cigarette butts. So that really indicated the need to start our own campaign. So what I would suggest, and for all the other classrooms is, do your own cleanup and see the patterns that emerge, and then compare that to your own school, and maybe the things that your school is using, like plastic straws and bags. So I would start there, and it's great to do both because the campaign and the beach cleanup, they just help reinforce the other. So I would definitely do both. And getting out on the beach, who doesn't want to do that? It's so much fun. So I would say definitely, you guys got to take a field trip. So I would suggest that and then launch your campaign. All right, and I think it's a great point to add that 
many of the classrooms joining us are in Ontario, so far from the ocean, but the yeah. samples coming back from the Great Lakes, both plastics and microplastics, a very, very high concentration uh, of plastics in the waters because there's so many cities surrounding the Great Lakes. So there's tons of work and cleanup and things that can be done around the Great Lakes as well. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, people think it's just something that's isolated to the oceans, but the Great Lakes and all lakes in Canada are definitely impacted and it impacts our food chains, our freshwater species. So there is a just as big of a need to address it in our, our Great Lakes as there are in our in our oceans. So that's great that everyone here today is really going to be getting on that. All right, so let's uh, head to Anaheim this time. Uh, California, Mrs. Morales' grade sixes are joining us. How are we doing for grade sixes? Excellent. All right. Do you have a story you want to share or a question for Lily? Sure. Hi. Can you see me? Hello. Hi. I'm Ms. Morales, and for our class, we've really been working on educating ourselves as far as um, researching endangered animals and seeing the threats that are causing them to become endangered. And what most of my students are finding is that um, a lot of the threats are coming from humans. So we are trying to be conscious um, about our, uh, our effect on these endangered animals. So our number one thing right now is working on educating ourselves about uh, different species and our effects to them. That's really great. Everything starts with education. And humans, we completely rely on the web of life. The more biodiversity we have on the planet, it's proven the stronger we are as a whole global ecological community. So that's a really amazing place where you are. And I love animals, so you're doing, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Um, can we go ahead and ask a question? I have one of my students right here. Yeah, please do. Hello. Hello, my name is Catherine, and uh, at what age did you start your interest for marine biology? That's a really good question. So I grew up, as I said, I lived in, I was born by the ocean, but I grew up in the Great Lakes where a lot of our classrooms are today. But um, I always loved the lakes, and I always loved being outside. And um, But when I was a kid, when I was your age, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot discussed on this. When I, when I meet people like yourselves, you're so ahead of the game. You know so much environmentally that it really, like, it, it really touches my heart because when I was your age, I had no idea. I had no idea about any of it. We really didn't talk about it. So to be completely honest with you, it was only when I went, what, 18 years old, when I moved back to Tofino and I started realizing how incredible the web of life here was, you know, how many amazing species from eagles to whales, sea otters, and how really the whole web of life here was being impacted and threatened by mining, by in-water fish farming, by fossil fuels like pipelines and spills and uh, logging that I really realized that it hit me really quickly at 18 that was, wow, I have to make a difference that I really need to spend my life um, working to heal our planet restore our planet, and um, inspire other people to do the same. So with all of you, you're really ahead of the game, and I'm really proud of all of you for the incredible work you're doing. And, um, yeah, you're all really inspiring me. So you really got this. All right. And let's do the final live class. We're going to go this time to Fairfax in the U.S. And you'll just have to confirm for me where that is. I think it might be Virginia, but just confirm for me. We're going to Mrs. Digby's. Grade 12 class, let me turn on their microphone. How are we doing, Fairfax? Hi, can you hear us? We can hear you, yeah. Um, okay, um, so we, we have a couple of questions for you. So our question is, uh, what does it mean to be a campaign manager? And also, how does one go about starting a campaign at their own school? This is awesome questions, and I love this because I've worked on quite a few campaigns, so I feel really passionate about it. So the first thing you should know, so at Surfrider we do campaigns and programs. So programs are ongoing. They basically, they are indefinite. They go on for long periods of time. Um, they're very much more educational based. So campaigns, the difference is, is that a campaign, you have a target, you have a goal, and you have an amount of time that you want to reach that goal. 
So for example, by April 22nd, uh, so next month, we have our goal of eliminating plastic straws in the town next to where I'm living now in Nuklulit. So that goal, we're either going to be successful by meeting that or we're not. So for me, I manage our campaigns and what that means is that we're on track with our goals. So with with the clue at going plastic straw free, we have 20 businesses who we want to help um, eliminate plastic straws from. So right now we are about two thirds of the way there. So to me, that really indicates that um, we are on track and we're going to meet our goal. But then you need to look at the other difficulties and challenges. Like certain businesses have different um, have different needs and different obstacles and different challenges. So when running a campaign, you really want to hear that other side. With a campaign, you have a goal for an environmental or social um, issue, but in order to really be sustainable in the long term, you really need to understand the whole spectrum of, of the reality. So, you know, hearing from the businesses. So what I would say that looks like in your school is, you know, look in your school and identify what an issue is. What is an issue that you would like to address that is realistic and you could do within a certain time period? Like let's say within the time of a school a school year. So once you do that, identify the goal, you can start creating steps for how you're going to meet that campaign. So you might have like a campaign team of five to ten people and you'll start, you'll start identifying the different roles and the different um, tasks that people are going to take on in order to meet that campaign. And um, yeah, so from there, you will just keep working towards it, having lots of meetings, and then tracking your progress. And uh, yeah, so you can launch a campaign as soon as you identify that need and you figure out exactly what you want to do and in the time that you want to do it. So what are you thinking for what campaign does your school want to launch? Um, focus more on recycling. Yeah, that would be good. So do you have recycling right now? We do. Uh, we recycle on Wednesdays. Yeah, we recycle on Wednesdays, and also um, we change from plastic plates to paper plates in our cafeteria. That is awesome. That's really awesome. So, what about your recycling? Do you want to um, see see an improvement in? Recycle more than once a week. <laughs> <laughs> So do you think that there is more recycle, they're just not able to recycle everything, like there's just really high volumes, is that part of the... Yeah, we have about six, seven thousand people that go to this school, so there's a lot of recycling that goes on, but it's not enough to collect it all one in one day. Yeah. Yeah, there was a couple ways I would go about that. I would um, meet with meet with the head of your school and figure out why it's just once a week. I would then maybe meet with the recycling company, you know, the contractor that your school has hired to come in and get that recycling. And then you're going to understand why they're doing it the way that they're doing it and what angle you'll have to make a difference. You know, at Surfrider, we have, um, we have the five R's. Let's see if I can remember them off the top of my head. I should. So the first one is refuse. So refuse to buy something, refuse plastics, then reduce, reduce the amount of things that we're consuming. Um, then rethink, re, Redesigning, so redesigning things that could be um, eliminated from the waste stream. So instead of having a plastic straw, having a glass one. So rethinking is all about design. Um, and then repurposing, taking things, you know, like a plastic bottle and then maybe using it for gardening. And then last is recycling. So for us, recycling is actually the last option um, because it all, Recycling, it creates energy itself. It takes fossil fuels to recycle things. So we should do everything in our power before that. So I would think about that. What are ways that you can actually limit the amount of waste that's actually going into your recycling at your school? Just like you got rid of plastic plates, there's other items like that that you're going to be able to identify and, and change, redesign, rethink, so that you don't have to do as much recycling. But I would start there. Start looking at what you can do to divert from your recycling stream and then meeting with the heads of your school, figuring out the way it is, way, the way it is, and then talking to your contractor. So you can definitely do it. All right, so we have two more minutes, Lily. So I'm gonna swing back through a couple of the classrooms and see if they have some follow-up questions for us. So I'm gonna go back to Mrs. Player's grade four. So your microphone's back on. Do you guys have another question? No. We don't have a question, but is it okay if we tell you some things we're doing at our school? 
Yeah, I would love to hear it. What you're doing, I can share with the schools here. Well, uh, at our school, we have a green team. So what they do is they think of new ideas to help save energy and help recycle at our school. Oh, and we also have an energy hog, which the <laughs> yeah. people put it in other classrooms when the lights are on and no one's in it. Hey, that's a really good idea. So what's it? What is the energy hog? It's just pretty much like a hog that's green, and it <laughs> people put it in your class when the lights are on, no one's in it, and then you put it in another class that has the lights on and no one's in it, and it keeps going. That's a really good idea because you know what? That's not shaming people. That's using humor and making people laugh is a really great way to make change. So I really love the energy hog idea. Can I share that with the schools here? Yeah. yeah. Cool. And are you all on the green team? Uh, no. no. It's for, what? I think it's grade five and up. Okay. Well, you should all definitely join when you get to that age. Being on green teams is awesome because you get to choose what you're going to change about your school. So that's really awesome. And you should still, hopefully you can still share the ideas you have now with them. We also have letterless lunches, which is where we don't throw out anything. And we have like a competition to see who has the least amount of garbage. That is such a good idea. I love that. Litterless lunches. Even that sounds really good. Um, I'd love to share that with people here as well. That's really, really cool. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great job. And like I was saying before, that's before even talking about recycling, you're going straight to the source. So you're refusing even creating plastics and creating litter in the first place, which is the best thing you can be doing. So I'm really proud of proud of your school and your classroom. You're doing a great job. And um, Surfrider, we have a forum on Facebook. I don't know if your school uses that. But any good ideas and things that you're doing, like litterless lunches, um, we have a public forum where you can post those ideas. And then all the schools here and all the people on our forum will learn from you. So if your teacher would like to do that, you're welcome to post on our public forum on all your ideas. All right. Well, thank you for sharing, Grade Fours. Those are some awesome ways that you're uh, helping out. Let's check in with our other Grade Fours, with Mrs. McKay, and see if they have a follow-up question. Hi. What's a good tool to use to pick up all the gar all of the garbage? That is a really good question. So it really depends on what you're going to be picking up. So if you are going to, where would you be doing your beach cleanup? Lake Ontario. Lake Ontario. Yeah, so what I would say is you definitely need to get gloves. Get some reusable gloves that your school can have and you can keep reusing. You know, sometimes we pick things up. We don't know where it's been. We don't know if it has any, um, contains any pollutants. So definitely get some gloves. And then you can get um, one of those litter tools that have like a claw on the end. And you can also use that to pick things up. But to be completely honest, in all of our cleanups, we just wear gloves and we just kind of go the old fashioned way. Sometimes with our remote cleanups, there'll be a lot of um, really big heavy stuff that we'll have to get like a chainsaw to move driftwood around. But I don't think you're gonna be using a chainsaw at this point. So I would say definitely get some uh, reusable gloves and then get out there. All right, great advice to get started. Let's visit Ms. Oh, Simon. Do we have another question? For sir, yes, we do. Uh, Bri, sir, we had a recess bell go. Yeah. So we have one more question. So <laughs> I have a collective group that stayed. But go ahead. How do natural disasters such as tsunamis impact the distribution of plastics in the ocean? Because we've been talking about natural disasters. And uh, we know with the tsunami in Japan, a, uh, a few years ago and then the tsunami that happened uh, in 2004 that the distribution of plastics is hitting the shoreline in the Pacific Coast. Can you stop please? And so we want to know how that impacts your cleanup and then um, generations and what we can do to, to help that cleanup effort. Yeah, that's a great question. So where I live is actually a tsunami hazard zone. 
So about a month ago, our whole town actually got evacuated because there was an earthquake in Alaska. So natural disasters are a very real threat where I live. And um, yeah, your question about how natural disasters impact um, pollution is a really great question. So when the Japan tsunami happened in 2011, it literally created that millions of um, millions of tons of debris went into the ocean. So what happens there is that our ocean has different systems called gyres. So in Canada, we are part, well, British Columbia, we're part of the North Pacific gyre. So Japan is also part of this. And what it is, is a whole current chain in the ocean. And that impacts, um, impacts the temperature. It also impacts what's moving in the ocean. So for Japan, when all of the debris went into the ocean, it was already very predicted of how it would spread. So this debris went all over the West Coast, um, really from, I would say, Washington up to Alaska. Um, that's where the debris went. So we actually had a huge cleanup effort all along the coast to collect all of the what's called marine debris and driftage from Japan. And um, in almost in a year and a half ago, so two Septembers ago, um, they did a big event where people from Japan actually came down and collected the stuff that had washed up onto British Columbian shorelines, which is pretty incredible that they were actually come, able to come and collect their stuff. So from what this, from what we learned from from that, from that natural disaster on an extreme scale is how um, marine debris from Japan is being distributed. So we gained a lot of data on how, um, on how stuff coming from that part of the world, where it would end up. So that's a lot of what we learned from that and how, yeah, so natural disasters, they're able to show us and give us more data um, in that sense. And obviously they are really unfortunate when they happen and the best thing that we can do is work to prevent them, prevent um, as much negative consequences as possible. So you know this means like building resilient shorelines, um, eliminating single-use plastics, um, yeah all of these kinds of things that ended up getting washed out to sea from Japan, a lot of them could have been um, preventable just by the way of not using them in the first place. But um, on the other side of it, the ironic side of it is that um, it actually really strengthened our British Columbians connection with Japan having this natural disaster happen we understand a lot more about marine debris and our nations are a lot closer as a result so, um, so the second part of the question of how what we can do to make a difference is again it's all through our behaviors so eliminating single-use plastics you know supporting businesses you know, maybe different stores that you like that carry paper bags, that don't use straws. You know, letting the businesses, if you go to a smoothie shop, letting them know that you don't want a plastic straw. All of your input all day long impacts the world around you, you know. So in your school, doing the same thing, like talking about your concerns and raising your voice and saying, this is what I would like to see made, like I would love to see this change we made, and then working towards it. So, yeah, I would do that. Start with yourself and it ripple out, ripples outwards. All right, great question, and good luck with your natural disaster studies. Uh, Anaheim, Mrs. Morales, do you guys have a, a follow-up? Yeah, hello, my name is uh, Richard, and what were the top campaigns you worked on? The top campaign? So, good question. Right now, um, for Surf Rider, we're working on these, we're finishing the Straw Suck campaign next month. So our whole region will be plastic straw free. We have the Ban the Bag campaign. So we're looking to eliminate plastic bags. We have the Ocean Friendly Business campaign. So next month, we're registering 15 businesses as ocean friendly. So meaning that they don't use single use plastics, they don't use harsh chemicals. Overall, their practices and operations are good for the environment and they're working to make change. So that's really cool because um, these businesses have made a lot of changes to comply with our, our criteria. And then one of my personal favorites is the hold on to your butt campaign. No one forgets the name of that one. So through that one, we are continuing to recycle cigarette butts. Oh yeah, another one I should mention, and uh, all the people in Ontario will be able to do this. So through the, the Ocean Friendly Business Campaign, we have set up pen, marker, and highlighter recycling. So anyone in Canada has free access to recycling pens, markers, and highlighters through TerraCycle. All you have to do in your classroom is get a box, 
and then put pens, markers, highlighters, any kind of plastic writing utensil, and then one, once it's finished, and then you can drop that off at Staples, and you'll be able to recycle it for free. And that's a cool thing you can do in your classroom, because I can even see right now, you're all using writing utensils. So that's another really cool thing that, that's been a spin-off of one of our campaigns. But um, I'm excited to do, I'm excited to finish campaigns and then start some more ones. What kind of campaign are you interested in doing? What do you guys think? Probably um, recycling water bottles, huh? Probably, like recycling water bottles? Because there's a lot of people who like leave their trash on the floor, like for their Cheez-Its, their goldfish that we get for like lunch, all that food. Cause they end up in a in a corner of our field, so I think like recycle, um, throwing those in the trash or recycling them. Yeah, that's a really good idea. And I mean, you could do it a couple, like you could do a couple of different things with the campaign. You could work to recycle the water bottles. You could also work to maybe create a contest or put a prize together for people to use reusable bottles so they don't use plastic in the first place. So people love contests and prizes. So you could potentially, yeah, woo, that's a nice one. So yeah, you could do something like that and get people using the reusable bottles as well. And I know I've been talking about beach cleanups, but you can do land cleanups as well. So do a cleanup in your schoolyard and then take photos of all the stuff you create and say, you know, we're finding so much cheese, cheese wrappers and goldfish wrappers and like, hey, let's work together to address this. So you can definitely do cleanups in your schoolyards as well. And that's a, that's a great thing to do, especially for your water bottle campaign because you'll collect some of those as well. All right, and let's visit our Fairfax group one more time. Uh, we have one more question. Um, how do you, do you want to ask your question? Uh, how do you guys clean those cigarette butts? That's a really good question, and luckily, I don't have to. So we'll is, um, we have canisters. I had a photo of them in my slides, and they look like a big cigarette. So what people do is they basically put the cigarette in that canister. Then we get a volunteer. Go, He goes around. He collects all the cigarette butts, puts them into a compostable bag, and then we mail them to Toronto. So luckily, I don't have to clean them. Um, when they get to TerraCycle, they have a process for getting out, getting the toxins out of the cigarette butts. So the cigarette, so those toxins they would deal with in a, in a responsive way, responsible way. I'm not sure what they exactly do, but they're going to have a way to sort of neutralize those chemicals instead of them going straight into our waterways. And then the cool part is, is that the cigarette butts get turned into plastic lumber. So things that our houses, our schools, all kinds of things are made of, um, cigarette butts are now being turned into those, which is great because those building materials are landlocked, um, and unless in the case of a tsunami, they're not going to be going anywhere. So the cigarette butts luckily aren't getting turned into straws or bottles, things that can go back into our oceans and lakes. They're getting turned into plastic lumber. So that's pretty cool about the Hold On To Your Buck campaign. And yes, luckily, I do not have to touch them. <laughs> All right. Well, Lily, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, all the incredible work that you do with uh, Surfrider Pacific Rim. And thanks for inspiring the students, listening to their projects, and giving them ways that they can do a little bit more and get more actively involved in protecting their waterways and the areas around their schools. Yeah, thank you all for having me. I'm so inspired from all of you, and I'm going to share your ideas with the towns here that we work in, as well as the students that we work with. Um, keep up the amazing work, and any change that you want to make, you can absolutely do it. So I hope you all start your campaigns, start your projects and your cleanups right away. Spring is the perfect time for it. So thanks to all of you. All right, so let me turn the classroom microphones on and classrooms feel free to be nice and loud. Say goodbye and thank you to Lily and then we'll sign off for today. So here we go. All right. Thanks everyone for hanging out today. Thanks everyone for hanging out today. We look forward to hosting you again.